like. Sorry about that. I meant to yeah, push. Okay. The uh, um, so um, the, I guess the, the first the first rule that, that we kind of uh, talked about when we were started out doing repairs, and you know, we didn't know anybody. We had been at this, you know, since the early '80s, and there was not a whole lot of information around. Uh, was you know what. Uh, we were breaking a lot of heads. To just put it honestly, we, we didn't know what we were doing. And so we, we didn't have the right tools. We didn't know what tools. We didn't know what we were doing. And, and so we, we kind of decided that the first thing we would do is, is to try not to make things worse if we could. Don't, don't do any harm, kind of like the, you know, the Hippocratic Oath. Uh, and, and in those days, we paid, we paid a real premium for pens that were working because, you know, with, uh, we didn't know how to really do much, um, and so uh, we were paying, you know, double, triple uh, prices for things. So after a while, some of us got together and we, uh, you know, we started some pen clubs early on in the 80s, and that, that was pretty good. We got some repair guys there, and they, they were teaching us some basic things. So let, let, let's start with some things that I think everybody should really know. So there's two things that are important for repairing old pens. And one is soaking and the other is heating, okay? And why do, we, why do we say that? Well, first of all, soaking is very good because a lot of the, the ink uh, is solids, dry, become encrusted, and uh, the pens not only don't work, but they're very, very difficult to repair. So what, when we say soaking, what do we do? Okay, so I'm gonna hold some of these up before we look at the tools. We, we use an ultrasonic cleaner, okay? A little, little tank and you put some water in. People ask me, what do you use to clean pens? And for the most part, I use just a little bit of ammonia. It seems to work really well. You'll see that when you put a little, little bit of ammonia in, maybe, you know, 10%, you'll see the ink start pouring out. And I'll put the, the pen with the point right in, in the, in and, and kind of fill it up, you know, about halfway. I try, I try not to, uh, soak the lever because it can get rusty, but um, you know, how long? I, you know, it won't hurt if it's a couple days even, you know, and you know, it's usually run on a, a, the vibrator runs on a cycle of two or three minutes, so you can do it several times, but you'll, you'll see when it starts, the ink starts, starts coming out, and then after a while, it'll slow down and stop. Now, I do caution you about one thing, because some of the plastics that the pen makers used had uh, some form of metal in them, uh, particularly like with the Waterman Patricians, the, um, uh, there, there are metal flecks in the plastic. And uh, if you leave them in too long uh, in, in the ultrasonic with too much ammonia, it'll start reacting and take the solids out and it'll discolor uh, the plastic. So that, that's not, to do the thing. The other thing we would tell you is that with hard rubber pins, we, we try to keep things as cool as possible. Hot water tends to just color black hard rubber and not so much red, but um, so we try to uh, control the temperature. We'll frequently change the water after a while. So, so this is a really good thing to have. This is probably the first thing that everybody should think about getting. And uh, we had, um, Held up a little uh, catalog from a company called Micromark, and I'm going to hold that up again because that's where I got mine, and, um, and they, they get on, they go on sale a lot, so they're, they're not real expensive. So this is this is the company, and uh, you can just go online. They have an online service, and they have a catalog, and you can get an ultrasonic cleaner, and they're not very expensive. So I think that's worthwhile. Uh, the second thing is a little, little more difficult because you kind of have to control it, and that's, that's temperature. Uh, and so what you'll find is a lot of the time the plastic, uh, not so much rubber, but rubber to a degree, but plastic tends to shrink over time because the, the camphor that's used to soften it evaporates and, and the plastic gets hard and shrinks. So heating after soaking, a little bit is good. And sometimes, listen, don't, don't be bashful. Sometimes when I was taking, a, uh, I was sweating bullets. Somebody brought in a, a Waterman 58 Ripple for me to repair, to take, resack. 
and, and just getting the section out of that barrel, I probably soaked and heated maybe 20 times before that, that thing finally gave up the ghost and I could get it apart and that was good. So where do I get a heater? So, okay, that's a good question. Micromark 2 has this heater. Um, it, it's, um, uh, it's not very expensive and it's not a variable temperature heater, but it's not too hot. It's not, it won't take paint off, off your car or anything like that, but you know, you kind of got to distance it. Um, there's a funny story. Uh, Osmond Sumer is a terrific pen guy and he comes from Germany and he never brings tools. So we had a thing where I, I would buy these and I would just hand them to him every time he would come to the pen show and he would just take it home with him. I don't, I never, I never saw one again, but I've probably gone through seven or eight of them for him. Uh, but, but he's nice because then he'll repair my, uh, my mom bought pen. So th this is a good thing. Uh, a more sophisticated heater is, is this kind. And um, pen tooling sells something which is the next generation of this. Um, and what's nice about this is it has a variable temperature control. So you don't have to, you know, you, you can warm this thing up, you can leave it on cold, but you can warm it up and up just to soften things and, uh, and not have to worry about overheating it. You don't have to worry about distance. You can, you can do that. So, so those, are, those are two things that everybody should really have. Um, a few other things that you should have that are really important too, okay? So um, tweezers, okay? Tweezers are really good. And, and I, I don't buy the kind that, uh, you know, takes your eyebrows out, uh, you know? These are, these are jeweler's tweezers and you can get them from any jewelry, jewelry supply house. Uh, and, and they're much more precision and they come in different sizes. As you can see, I've accumulated quite a collection over time. I've got six or seven of them. Um, uh, this is another thing that people don't realize how valuable this is. This is a dull knife. Uh, and you say, well, at the end, what, what, what purpose would you have for a dull knife? And the answer is that you're um, scraping the old remnants of the sack off of the section. And a dull knife actually won't you know, break or cut the section. Let, let me um, stop here and give everybody a really important tip that I, I learned after many years of messing up some pens. And that is, it, when, you, uh, when you start uh, scraping out uh, or taking off the old section here, uh, uh, one of the things that you should do is leave the feed in the pen when you take the old remnants of the stack off, because it will make sure that you're not uh, compromising that nipple and breaking it off. The section, leaving the feed in there in that section will help you. So I, I learned that uh, lesson, unfortunately, the hard way after breaking a bunch of sections and squaring a lot. So, so that's that's one tip that, that uh, I think is important. So the dome knife is is good for that. And we we always scrape around, never back and forth. We always kind of scrape around. Uh, this is this is for old people like me. Um, it's something that you use to you know uh, grab uh, uh, jars when you can't you know unscrew them. But it's very good for holding the parts uh, in your hand when you take them apart. So I, I, I strongly recommend these. I buy them and you know after they wear out I can I can throw them away. So that's very good. Um, this is this is uh, a small. Uh, circular, you know, a rat tail file. This is, this is very good for cleaning out the sections after you've gotten the pen apart because their ink, ink stays in the section and the feed needs to kind of slide easily in and out of the section where you can get the nib in. So that, that's an important, an important tool. Um, some other things people uh, might want. Um, this is, this is, commercial shellac pen tooling sells it. That's the best thing for attaching a new sack onto the, the nipple that I found. Um, it, it comes off easily. It's not, not too abrasive. Uh, talcum powder is good. People put this on the sack before sliding it in to the barrel. Um, this is uh, Amodex, which takes ink out of almost everything. And I, you know, most many of my shirts um, that's an important thing. Uh, this is metal polish. 
Uh, there's a couple of good brands. This is uh, Flitz. The only thing that I caution you, it's really corrosive on your hands. And so um, a lot of us wear you know, gloves when we, we polish the metal parts of our pen so we don't have breakout in the rash. Uh, this is a, um, uh, if you can see that, that's a white rubber uh, sack sizer. Uh, and they're still available. You can get these and find them online. They're not terribly expensive. They're really good for figuring out uh, what size replacement sack that you need. So I've, I've had the same one for a long time, and I think some people are even making some reproductions. Um, what else do we have here that are basic? Okay, we have a bunch of brushes, uh, bottle brushes, toothbrushes, you know, all kinds. These are really good for cleaning uh, the barrels out. Um, um, on pens and uh, especially shaper pens. I think they're, they're, they're really, really important. Um, one other thing that I think is really um, very useful and um, that is some sort of a magnifier. Some people use a loop, but uh, again, Lycra Mark has come through with one of these uh, uh, magnifying uh, uh, Little uh, headsets there, and um, I find this is this is great. Um, I, I use it a lot, and um, it leaves both my hands free, which I really like too. So those are um, those are some of the basic things, um, and and I think almost everything that I've shown you is is available uh, and still can be purchased. So um, again, I, I would urge you to. You know, think about getting these, and then um, you know, some people say, "Well, what are what are the easiest pens to repair?" Right? Um, so I, I think I kind of started with uh, you know, uh, Schaefer touchdowns weren't too bad. Um, we'll talk a little bit about replacing uh, some of the parts on those. As those aren't too bad. Parker dual folds, you know, I think, and lucky curves, you know, any kind of a sack pen. Um, so. You know, those those are kind of how how I started and you know gradually moved into some other the more sophisticated items. Okay, um, having spent a few minutes, I should should uh, pause and ask if there's any um, important questions or things that I missed here that people would like to know before I move into some more specialized items. Ken, I'm going to let you uh, go into the chat room and. Uh, yeah, there's there's nothing in chat right now, but if anybody's got a question at this point, uh, you can either come off mute and ask it or pop it into chat and I'll read it out. Okay, it looks like we're doing okay so far. We put everybody so. to sleep. So. <laughs> all right, now, now all I'm going to do is I'm going to take uh, my camera off of me and, and show you some of the tools here that I've got here and then kind of uh, explain some of them as we as we go along here. Okay. So um, wow, what I what I have here uh, uh, arrayed here in the in the gray metal tray are are uh, shaper tools that are um, described and were sold by the Schaefer Pen Company. This is uh, this is a Schaefer parts and repair manual. And um, all of these tools are uh, described and uh, illustrated in this in this manual, uh, which is apparently out of print for quite a number of years. But let me let me show you some of the things that they I talk about that are Fairly, fairly uh, immediate. Okay, so this is a little jeweler's hammer, right? Everybody can see that it's it's small and it's light, so that you're you're not um, uh, breaking any parts with it. We use that in connection with a, a knockout block. Um, this is a, a block which has some holes here, and uh, the purpose of it is um, to remove. Our, our nibs and feeds, um, we, we put it into this corresponding hole and we use this little punch, everybody can see, right? And uh, punch out the nib and feed, gently tapping it. Of course, again, heating and soaking is essential. 
and then you know as you'll see the feed will start um, and it will start coming out. Hey Dan, it's a little bit dark uh, on okay. the camera here. Is it? Do you have a light that you could turn on that's a little bit? Uh, let's, let's see if I turn this one on behind me. If that helps. Is that better? That oh good? yeah, that's a lot better. Oh good. Okay, fine. Okay. I was just afraid that if I turned it on. Okay, so now we we've, we've used our little uh, knockout block here, and as you can see, that works great. Uh, this one. Is particularly designed by Parker because it has a little hollow, uh, uh, the, the knockout tube is hollowed out. So when you're using a, a vacuum, you're, you're trying to knock a feed out of a vacuumatic or a 51, you can slip this over the breather tube and knock it out. And you won't take the breather, won't break the breather tube off uh, and when you take the feed out. So that's, that's a good thing. Okay, so that's that. People say, what the heck is that? Um, this is an inner cap puller. <laughs> uh, and for those of you who uh, have never used one of these um, and you wanna, wanna sweat off a few pounds, it's a good thing. It's, it's used to remove uh, the inner cap so you can get the clip out. There's a, a Parker has a screw on inner cap so you, and they're dual folds, but the, uh, most of the other pen companies use the friction fit uh, inner cap. So, um, uh, first of all, again, heating and soaking, heating and soaking, heating and soaking. You really got to get all the ink out. And then what you do is you uh, turn the bottom part and it expands in, uh, inside the inner cap. And then you um, turn this and it, it slowly pulls it out and makes terrible noises. You think you're breaking your pens. And sometimes you are. Uh, this one has a a thruster bearing here at the bottom so that there's an even tension around and it helps uh, so you don't break the cap lips. But that was another Schaefer that came with a, you know, it's in, again, it's in the Schaefer repair manual. Um, th this is a section pliers. Um, and uh, as you can see, I, I, it's a very good idea to buy some rubber tubing and uh, slip it over the end because otherwise the metal will scratch the um, or rubber of this, or most of the sections are hard rubber or plastic. So we try to use these um, to keep things. And you can see this has been well worn. Um, uh, again, a good thing to have. Um, this is a, a sack spreader. So when you um, are replacing the sack, uh, over the nipple, it will spread it so you can get it get it on there, and uh, uh, that's a that's a pretty valuable tool. Oh, well, one thing about the um, knockout block is it it doesn't work for uh, Parker or Lucky Curve uh, feeds. Uh, they you know break them. They have that piece. Uh, people say, how do you um, uh, how do you get the Lucky Curve feeds out? Well, you have to kind of um, heat the section and the and the feed and kind of wiggle the nib out the front and then uh, put the uh, section and the feed in the ultrasonic uh, cleaner for a while, get the ink solids out and then eventually it will slide out the back. But it's um, it, it's harder to take those out and assemble them, the lucky curves. You'll find a lot of them, your parent just got tired and broke them off so they could put them in, in the front uh, conventionally. but. Um, so that was just a word to the wise. Okay, what else do we have? Okay, this is this is what's called a Bernard or parallel jaw pliers. Okay, this is really good for having even tension. Uh, we use these for sometimes removing, but mostly installing the nibs and feeds back into the section. And we put a little. Uh, I just put a piece of rubber tubing uh, in there and slip the the nib and the feed in there, and then. I can uh, generally warm it up and, and get it back into position. Uh, there is a, a specialized uh, pair of Bernard pliers that has a groove in them that's used for taking the uh, breather tubes, removing and installing the breather tubes in Schaefer, PFMs, and snorkels, um, which is a very, very handy item. I don't have that one out here right now. Okay, um, this is a... This is a nib, uh, another Schaefer item that came in the kit. This is a nib pliers. 
Um, it is a conventional pliers, but um, it's been sanded smooth on the inside so that it doesn't leave any marks on the nib. So it's used to uh, bend nibs uh, or straighten them a little bit before you put them in, in the block. Um, so that's a handy, a handy tool. Um, this is um, a scraper. Uh, this, this is a triangular knife scraper that you use for cleaning the inside of the barrels uh, when the sack is dried and is inside there. Uh, let's see what else we can show you. This is, this is an important uh, tool for installing uh, the pressure, uh, the, the lever bars in, in Schaefer pens. And there are several different models. Uh, this is for the earliest model and you basically attach the, uh, see if I got one here. Lever like this, and then it's installed into the barrel. Uh, this is another, uh, one of these is used to install a pressure bar and this is to remove it. It's got a little hook on the end. Um, let's see what else we have. This is a really important tool. Um, and I, I don't know if I can really demonstrate it well here, but uh, for uh, the Schaefer balance pen, the lever is on a little arc piece of wire. And the arc piece of wire sits inside a little groove inside the barrel. So this, this holds the, uh, the lever and it has a little notch in it where you put the, the little wire arc and you slide the whole thing into the, into the barrel. It's a very useful tool for lever filled pens. Um, because I, I, I was never able to do one before uh, I found this tool. Um, let's see what else we can show you. Some of these other things are a little more esoteric. This is an inner cheaper inner cap puller for metal uh, metal caps. This is um, a tool that's used for pushing the, the push rod out. Um, yeah, one of these push rods for the Schaefer plunger fillers because you can't get the uh, you, you can't get the push rod all the way out after you get the barrel out. So this is this is something that they invented. Um, okay, a couple other things. These are um, used to unscrew the washer nut that holds the, uh, the blind cap in a Schaefer plunger filler. I don't know, I, you know, it's one of my least favorite repairs is repairing Schaefer plunger fillers. I just, I just think they're, you know, even after you do it, they're waiting to deteriorate. <laughs> and so, I don't do too many of them if I can avoid it. Um, these are very important tools. Um, so as some of you may know who have ever tried this, there's a, a, a O-ring washer in the back of a Schaefer PFM and also in the back of a snorkel and also in the back of a touchdown. And you can, you can get uh, replacement O-rings, you know, they, they kind of look like this. And when they get hard, let me uh, hold this up with a, uh, my tweezers here. So uh, if you can see this, it's, it's soft and pliable, but when they get hard, it, they won't seal anymore and, and the pen won't, won't hold in. So they come in two sizes. Uh, getting them out, you use a little dental pick or something. Getting them back in is, uh, causes a lot of uh, swearing. So um, th these, these tools were made to go into the back of the barrel and hold, uh, and so the O-ring doesn't slide down the barrel while you're trying to put it in. And it's, a, it's pretty effective and it, it really helps a lot. And if you practice with them for a while, they're, they're pretty good. Um, this is a tool that's used to remove the, um, threaded section in a PFM. So um, I think that's highly valuable and, and very helpful. Um, these are used to hold the Schaefer uh, blind caps on the, uh, on the PFMs and the um, snorkels. 
So they come in a couple different sizes and that fits in there and will hold it. There's a little screw that goes down in there. Um, so that, that's a, a kind of a valuable little piece and obviously fairly inexpensive. Okay, I think, I think we've gone through now most of the important shaker tools. We stop here and does anybody have any questions about any of the things that we've looked at so far? And then I think we'll move on a little bit. Those inner cap removal tools. Yes. Like how, how easy are those to find? Because I, I can I think, use those. They are still being made. I think, I think uh, pen tooling maybe uh, have reproduced, has reproduced them. It's, it's essential. There's no other way to, to get an inner cap out. And um, yeah, again, I, I caution everybody heating, soaking, heating, soaking, because that, that really tends to shrink around there. And even using one of these, uh, when the inner cap starts to come out, it makes this terrible tearing noise and you think you're destroying your pen. Uh, and even if you're not, it still makes this, this awful noise. So. You know, just keep at it and keep at it, um, and 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 they work. They work pretty well. It's a couple different sizes, but um, you know, the, the first couple of times it's a little scary to do that. But I have to say that with about most of the pen repairs. Okay, any any questions now so far? And then I think we'll spend a couple of minutes looking at some of the Parker tools. Things, okay. As we uh, we're moving out here, a um, couple other things though before our um, we get there. Uh, this is this is a Gerstner cabinet, and I use it to keep all my pen tools in, so I don't lose them because it's aggravating when you do. Um, this is a toolmaker's cabinet. And, uh, the nice thing about these is uh, they had little flaws in them. They would sell them really cheap, and you could you could buy them. I don't know if they still do anymore or not. Um, one of the things which I wanted to show and discuss was this this item. So I don't know if people can see this, but this is a, a Wall Eversharp. Um, as as um, many of you know, um, in the 20s, uh, Wall Pen came out with something called a personal point, which means that you could go to the store, figure out what point you wanted in your pen, and it would screw right into the section, and section into the barrel. Um, and it was actually a really good idea because then you could buy the pen on the spot and they just had to have some extra nibs in store. Um, but after a while, um, they're not so easy to get out. Again, heating and soaking, but this slips over the nib and feed and then it holds it so you can turn it. And it has four different sizes and, uh, uh, and you, could, you could use the Bernard pliers instead, but uh, it's kind of a handy little item for, for working on those. Okay, what else we have in here? Um, I did want to show you uh, uh, Ken's favorite tool, which I had here someplace here. One second. Because um, he kept asking me about this and it's for somewhere. Ah, okay. So here's a little uh, tray that we have of Parker, Parker items, okay? This is the first item. And this item is just a little um, springy metal, uh, like, a, I don't know, a hook? I wouldn't even call it a hook. But Ken, this is what you use to, to slide the pressure bar back into the dual folds, and especially the streamlined ones, OK? So you just um, slide this in to the barrel first, and then you slide the uh, the pressure bar side down, the metal side down into this, and it slides in much easier. Wow. So, um, yeah. Um, you know, one of the other things that I have managed to accumulate over time is uh, a bunch of the Parker service manuals. So I have them bound in a book here, and they talk about, you know, uh, just that repair. Uh, this is another service manual uh, for the Parker, mostly for the Parker 50 ones, uh, but they're, they're pretty good and uh, they, they help a lot. I assume most people are familiar with uh, 
Frank, this is the late Frank Dubiel's book. Okay, it's still in print. And then uh, uh, Jim Marshall and Larry uh, Oldfield did this, this book in England and it's now in its second edition, which I understand is even better than the first edition. I haven't gotten one yet, but um, those, are, those are good resources for people who want to repair their pens. Okay, so what else do we have here in the Parker stuff that would be of, of interest to people? Well, you know, we use our section pliers a lot. We use our knockout block. We use our sack spreader all the time. We don't need the inner cap puller. Um, but, but when we get into the, uh, this was a, a Parker tool for scraping the old sacks out of uh, barrels. I mean, you don't need to anything this fancy, but it's good to have something. Um, I, I have, uh, yeah. A fairly substantial array of dental picks. Uh, I did not rob a dentist. Uh, um, uh, Sam Fiorello was uh, selling them for a while as long as you promised not to use them on your teeth. And, uh, but, but uh, you know, in all different sizes and shapes and they're pretty good for, for doing that at work as well. Okay, probably um, the tool that most repair people use the most who do any Parker pens are these uh, these uh, vacuumatic and 51 filling unit wrenches. Okay, they, they are there are three different ones in the in the group, and there there are different versions of these, and some are more expensive or less expensive. These happen to be the originals. Okay, so what what's so important about this? Well, I have a lovely Parker vacuumatic, and I want to remove the filling unit. And so I thread it in here and it holds it and it allows me then to unscrew the barrel and I get the filling unit out in one piece like that and I don't, I don't wreck the threads. And so it's, it's a really important tool. And um, this is, this one fits the standard size. Um, this one fits the oversize um, vacuumatics. The standard size also does the 51. And, and this long one is for the aerometric 51s. It holds those so you can unscrew the, uh, the hood or the shell. Um, I don't have a, sorry, I don't have an aerometric 51 here. But that's, that's a really, really important tool for everybody who wants to, to uh, do those those repairs and there's no substitute. And you can tell when people have uh, tried to do that without using the right tools because there's the, the threads are all messed up and the line caps don't fit on. Okay, what else do we have in this box here that's really interesting? So um, these are uh, cap arbors. If you're going to repair a 51 and you wanna take the clip off, this, this goes and slips inside. Um, this is something that a Parker repairman, Jerry Flynn gave me years ago for undoing the, the jewels um, on the top of the caps. And then these are screwdrivers that, that take the, uh, uh, the clip screw out. So I can unscrew the clip. I can put my cap arbor in and then unscrew, well, this one's a little tight for now, but, um, and so those are very important. There's, a, there's one for the pencil. Um, these supposedly are good for removing the, um, hooking the nibs out of the 51 uh, uh, sections and, uh, taking, and taking them out, they're, they're okay. Um, this is uh, another Jerry Flynn special. It's a piece of cork, uh, it's, excuse me, it's a piece of rubber uh, with a hole drilled in it for clamping on to the front end of the 51s and unscrewing the hoods. After you've heated and soaked it enough, it'll, it'll come out. So those are, those are um, kind of important things. This is a tool that I don't recommend people use unless they're really sophisticated. 
So the 51 barrel and, um, and blind cap were not often in the same size. So they would put that barrel into a lathe and they would smooth the, the joint using this, this um, essentially this blade. And I have one and um, I, I never really liked using it. Um, it's, a, it's a pretty uh, difficult repair. Um, I'm going to show you a few more things while I'm up here and then we'll kind of pause and see if anybody has some questions. Um, th this is a really uh, good thing uh, and it made my life better. This is, this is a Parker 51 cap toolkit. And uh, uh, Lawrence Oldfield in England came up with this and I think they're still available. Uh, inside, you can see that are uh, some items and basically it's, it's a puller that pulls uh, the, the clutch mechanism out of the 51 cap. And then it's, a, it's an arbor, you slip the, the cap into it, and then you roll another piece of metal over it, and it takes the dents out. And it really works. I mean, it really works. And um, I'd be careful if a pen has got a heavy engraving, it'll take that out too. So you, you want to be careful. But it's very good at taking dents out, uh, 51 caps, and restoring those. And just a little demonstration on it. Get these all these ratty caps. And, uh, and fix them and it, it works quite well. There's a, a pencil arbor, there's a, a couple other items in there and uh, uh, I, think, I think they're really good. Uh, Stuart Hawkinson, if some of you may know him from, uh, uh, from Oregon, was making a, a kit as well. It wasn't quite as easy to use, but it, it worked pretty well. And uh, uh, so again, another, another good resource for Repairing your pens if you want to restore 51s, which you know a lot of people do. Um, uh, I think it's really good. I didn't show anybody how to um, resack a, a, or put a new diaphragm in a 51 or a vacuumatic. That would probably take up all the time that we had here. Um, but there's a, a couple tools that are uh, make it a little easier. Um, back to our. So Dale Beebe of Pen Tooling uh, decided that he would make a, uh, produce a tool to make it easier for installing the diaphragms. This is what it looks like. Um, he, he uh, on one side is a little, a little cup with a hole in it, which he felt was good for um, protecting the, the cup where the little uh, hard rubber ball goes in to hold the sack into the into the cup. Uh, I use a Dremel tool, which I have back there, um, to take out the, the remnants of the old uh, the old ball that held the sack in place. And again, very important to warm it up and heat it before installing a new one. Then you can put the uh, vacuumatic diaphragm on here and push it in. Uh, it's got a little place where the, the ball stays in, and so that's a Use that on um, really every 51 repair of, um, you know, with the vacuumatics that I have. Um, guitar strings are good for cleaning out um, feeds and also for jam pencils. I highly recommend those. Um, trying to think what else I could show you that would be of use. There's some specialized items. This is a, uh, a little, um, this is for taking out old hard erasers. It screws into the eraser and then you can pull it out. Sometimes the eraser breaks off anyway, so it's a little bit of frustration. Um, okay. Let's see. If you get crazed and you wanna re-neural, your Parker blind caps and inner caps and your dual folds. This is a knurling tool. If you heat black hard rubber, the chasing comes out of it. You can you can repattern them. Um, it's 
really something that I think it's um, not for practice, won't hurt anything. Uh, this is a Parker 61 staking tool for putting a new cell into a 61. Uh, it's a repair I hate. I don't like to do any of them. Last item that I think we'll go through and show today. This is a Waterman lever box installation tool. So um, you put the uh, new lever box in and then you squeeze this and push it and it um, pull, pushes the tines up on the side to keep the lever box in place. It's a, again, not a fun repair, not, not one of my favorites, but uh, it comes in handy. Uh, everyone's happy. Okay. Uh, so I've basically taken up most of the time that I wanted to, and I appreciate everybody's patience, and I will answer questions for the last few minutes until people get tired. I've seen the parking repair manuals of Acumatic Fitting Block. Do those exist? in the wild. Yes, they do, but the um, squeeze types are uh, far more uh, versatile. What somebody's asking me about is this tool, right? <laughs> I, I actually had a Russian uh, machinist who reproduced these. I made a hundred of them and sold them out. Um, but uh, it's the same principle. Here's the two holes here. Uh, this one has a little nib gauge up at the front, if you like, and uh, a knockout blocks uh, there. Um, this one doesn't have a, a removable uh, punch, but um, yes, these are, these are still around, but I think almost every repairman would say, that these are functionally much better to use and easier. Um, but same principle, you thread the uh, um, the filling unit in, turn this down and hold it, and then you can unscrew it as well. Okay, I hope we answered that question. Yeah, these are all, yeah, every once in a while they show up. Oh, okay. Glad I could answer that one. Yeah, Heather had asked a question a couple minutes ago. Um, is there something that can help repair a rose glow finish that has some dark spots over the stripes? Um, okay, so a lot of people ask some questions about, you know, what do you do about discolored plastic or discolored hard rubber? And unfortunately, there really, there really isn't very much that we can recommend. We, we do, sometimes um, the dark spots can be on the inside of a cap and cleaning out the ink out of it will help. Uh, but if plastic has been discolored, there really isn't uh, anything that anybody has found that will restore, restore that. People have tried and had some success working on hard rubber uh, they use uh, various commercial products and sometimes they work and sometimes they don't. Uh, hard rubber and plastic all had dyes that were used uh, in them. So black hard rubber is probably the easiest to restore. Um, some people, there's a product uh, called, I think it's Bletch. It's a tire, it's a, a tire restorer product. Um, smells bad, like rotten fruit, but I think it, um, some people have had some success with that if they want to try that. Um, but, um, you know, and, and um, but other than that, I'm afraid there isn't much good to restore um, uh, plastic when it's become discolored. Sorry. And you could probably lift your, uh, your camera up so we can see your face. We're still looking at the tools on okay, your desk. Okay, yeah, we don't need the tools anymore. Okay. <laughs> okay, if we go back there. Okay. 
Cool. All right, there we go. How's that? Okay. Yeah. And Kathy asks, uh, what are the challenges of working with the materials of vintage pens, different than our modern plastics? Uh, familiar, you know, things that are unfamiliar to us, uh, weird melting points, other properties. How do you identify and research what they're made of? Okay, that's a really good question. So um, let's start with this. For, for um, many, many years, up until the mid 20s, uh, all pens were, well, fountain pens were made of hard rubber. Even the overlays uh, were hard rubber underneath. And hard rubber is generally pretty inert. It doesn't, it doesn't, uh, doesn't have a whole lot of problems. It does crack and you have to be a little bit careful with it and it's not terribly repairable. Starting in about 1925, Schaefer first and then the other company started making plastic fountain pens. And the way that they, the plastic is made, which was then nitrocellulose, is the same way that you make dynamite. And so there were a few accidents along the way, um, but basically you take uh, uh, cotton and nitric acid and uh, some other chemicals and you kind of boil it around and heat it up and then, uh, then eventually slowly cool it. And, um, and sometimes they had stabilizers like camphor and things like that. Um, so we, we kind of know uh, which, by looking at the pen and knowing the error that it was made, what type of plastic was used. So nitrocellulose is actually pretty easy to work with. It um, can be repaired, it can be heated, uh, and um, you can kind of take some of the names out of those things and, uh, and, and uh, not, nothing, nothing too bad. Then in the, in the uh, 40s, uh, the DuPont company invented um, uh, another type of plastic, which are then used in the, in the 51s. And uh, uh, in part, <laughs> maybe it's maybe too much information. If you get um, bored, just let me know. The, the concept was that uh, Parker wanted to develop an ink that could be written with by left-handed people, which was quick drying and would, uh, would not smear the paper. So ink is generally acidic and paper is acidic. So um, when people write with them, it takes a while to dry. Quick drying ink is uh, alkali based, reacts with the acid in the paper and dries much quicker. Unfortunately, the alkali based uh, ink is destructive of nitrocellulose. So they had to find another plastic uh, that they could use. And so uh, it's essentially the same plastic that was used in airplane canopies and, and what have you. And, uh, but it didn't, it didn't destroy the, um, it didn't the ink then didn't destroy the plastic. Unfortunately, it couldn't be uh, used like vacuumatics in different colors and the solid colors. And so the 51s use that particular type of plastic and, and it still is pretty stable. Now the newer plastics that are made today are, are all different and, and they have uh, little melting points. And a lot of them are uh, made <coughs> so that they can be inject, injected, uh, injection molded. Uh, up until, uh, well really, even up until really about the Parker 61 era. So in the, in the late 50s, uh, um, plastic pens were made by solid, by drilling out solid rod stuff and uh, much stronger and, um, but more expensive to make. And so they started then making plastics that could be injection molded. They don't hold up as well, um, but you can see the difference in value if anybody collects old Mont Blancs the ones that are made of nitrocellulose, um, you know, uh, up until you know the 60s are highly valued. Even the 149s go for a lot more money, and the plastic ones they make today are, are not really as good. Uh, in terms of processing them and using them, um, you know, uh, you have to be careful. Um, you can sand and polish them. Um, there's a company called uh, Micromark make uh, uh, plastic polishing kits with some very fine 
uh, sanding items and you can use those to take scratches out of cans you know, without any difficulty to make some uh, polishes that are pretty good. Some people swear by Carnuba. Um, it's not bad, but um, uh, most of those things can be uh, worked on without too much, too much difficulty. I don't know if I answered anybody's question or not. Hopefully I did. Hmm. Yeah, there's uh, Daniel asks, are there parts or suitable materials to make new parts for sack filling mechanisms, such as lever pins, bars, et cetera? Well, that's a good question. Yeah, um, yeah they're kind of hard to find um, because nobody's really, I mean, you can certainly, uh, sacks are available from the Penn Sack Company in all different sizes, and they have an order form you can go online and download it, and uh, they'll help you figure out um, if you tell them the kind of pen. But, but the, the metal parts for sack filling pens are very, very difficult to get now. And so we you know, generally, um, I think somebody's making carpet pressure bars. So those are, those are, we're producing those, those are pretty available. I haven't seen anybody making um, uh, any lever boxes. Well, I think for a while somebody was trying that, but they're really not. And uh, uh, they're just not, not a whole lot. So we, we kind of either recycle them or you know find old uh, pen repair shops and buy buy all their parts if we can. So like here are my stash of uh, shaker leather leather uh, bars and fillers. Wow. Fortunately, Schaefer made like seven different sizes, so. Um, the bigger ones you can cut down to make fit. The smaller ones, if they're too small, will work. So. All right. Ryan asks, any advice on Schaefer vac filler repair? He replaced the plunger washer, but he's hesitant on the packing unit. Yeah. Um, OK, so um, a packing unit, first of all, we never replaced the packing units when we tried everything but replacing the packing unit. So um, sometimes soaking them works because it's just a little piece of felt back there. And uh, if you can get enough ink out, sometimes they're good, sometimes they're not. Um, and um, we use um, some silicone on the, uh, on the plunger rod. It will also help create a seal. Uh, and we do that. And this is assuming that the front seal is good. Um, let's see. Yeah. Um, so I'm holding up one of these, and um, you know there's a there's a front seal as well with a fibrous washer, and if that's that's shot, which is again uh, depending on what model, uh, can be uh, a challenge. Um, I would say one thing about um, Schaefer they they did not, as far as I can tell, use shellac. They they used a a very strong glue. And as far as I can tell, it was made by mixing uh, rosin, like bow rosin, with castor oil. And uh, you heat it, and it's, it's, it's pliable and somewhat viscous. But one, once it cools and sets, it's really hard. And it's difficult to get off. Um, and so um, you know, triumph nibs and things like that, and sections or are, are, feeds are, are somewhat difficult because they're glued with that really, really difficult glue. So um, again, uh, David Nishimura uh, has uh, a good uh, source for repairing plunger fillers. He has the parts and he has a little washer uh, that you could use that actually works very well. And he has a little tutorial, uh, I think on his website about how to do it. It's very, very helpful and I would, would strongly recommend it. He also sells good repair pens for other pens as well. So um, that's what I would try, but um, try everything else before, before doing that. <laughs> All right, Jennifer asks, I've seen pens for sale that have bent or warped barrels. Is that something that can be corrected or would it not be worthwhile? I, I generally try to stay away from them uh, if I can. 
you know, it's generally somebody has heated something or left it out and it's, it's, uh, it, it can be straightened out, but you need to warm it and you generally need a mandrel of some kind so that uh, as you are warming the barrel, you're, you're inserting the mandrel in so that if you can straighten it out and not too many people um, have a mandrel or want to make one out of a, a dowel rod. You can use wooden dowel rods to make them. If you have a lathe, then you can lathe it, lathe it down. So basically what you're doing is you're um, warming the barrel and you're inserting this mandrel in. And so the more you warm it, you know, again, you can't overheat it and you're trying to, to straighten that barrel out and then let it cool around the mandrel. Um, but we, we try, we think there's enough pens out there to where we don't generally have to do that. A lot of, a lot of Conklin barrels uh, worked because uh, the plastics weren't uh, real, real stable. And some of the walls work, but we, we try not to buy them if we can. So that's my advice is um, if you must and you think you have a great pen and you really think it's worth it, you know, try to go, go to the hobby store and Try to find a dowel that's the same. I mean, if you have a caliper and you can do that, that's good too. And you can know exactly what size mandrel you, you'll have to make to fit into the barrel. But of course, if the barrel's tapered, the mandrel is more difficult then because if you've got to taper the mandrel as well. So um, again, if it's really, really something that you know, you're in love with and it's your heart's desire, okay, but otherwise try not to buy them. All righty, that's uh, all the questions we have in chat. Does anybody have other questions they'd like to put out there? You can come off mute and yell it out. Well, don't yell it, but you can come off mute and ask your question directly. You could put it in chat. Can uh, you uh, redo that? Uh... That wrench, you had the three wrenches, you were just at the top of the screen and I couldn't see the operation that you were doing. Okay, so if we're talking about the vacuumatic. Right. Yeah, it's these three. Okay, and, and I don't know how well these, these show, but um, the, the first two were um, invented during the vacuumatic era and um, they're for the different size filling units in the, in the vacuumatic pen. One is for the oversize and the other fits the standard and the, uh, and the smaller size, the debutante. And basically um, uh, they have a little, this little lever squeezes down. You thread the filling unit in, you squeeze down on it and it holds it so you can then unscrew the barrel. The third one, which is the, uh, obviously you can see is much longer and the other two it is used for the aerometric 51s and 61s. And, and the purpose of them was that it would hold the filling unit so that you could uh, then remove the shell on the 51. This was not used for any type of vacuumatic, but it was used for 51s and 61s. Again, holding the, the, holding the filling unit in place so you can unscrew the shell. Again, after you've soaked it and, and warmed it enough so that it will come off easily. Is that, does that help? Yes, it did. Thank you. You're very welcome. And Bill asks uh, if you have a source for foreign pen parts. Wow, okay. Yeah, that's, um, again, depending on uh, the type of, of part, um, um, you know, Osmond Sumer, is uh, a, a very wonderful pen repair guy. Um, and uh, he lives in Germany, but generally comes to pen shows and has a lot of Mont Blanc and Pelican parts with him, sometimes some others, and um, um, has some Lamy parts as well. Uh, once in a while, you'll still see things on eBay, but um, the, the people who, repair those pens generally are not interested in selling their parts. They're generally uh, hoarding them so they can do repairs. Mont Blanc has become particularly difficult. They don't like to sell any of their 
uh, parts now, repair parts. They, they have only dealers and uh, very few of them. So getting spirals and things like that are, are difficult. There are a couple, again, if you go on, um, online or on eBay, you might find some sources uh, for some of the parts, the more, the more common ones, but um, it, it's, it's somewhat, somewhat difficult on foreign stuff. The English, English parts, um, the people in the Writing Equipment Society, I don't know if anybody knows about them. They're really some terrific, some terrific group of people. They have repair seminars and other things. They're based out of England and uh, they, they have uh, people who do sell um, uh, repair parts for English pens. Um, you know, certainly English, uh, English parkers, but even some of the English uh, manufactured pens. Um, swan parts, I, I particularly like swan pens, and I, and I think their parts are, are hard to find, but I think you can find some there from them. These are all good questions, so I really appreciate people asking. Yeah, and it looks like there's not any more questions lined up, um, although I'm putting in I've been kind of cultivating a few of the resources that you've uh, listed. So I just put in links to Micromark and there's pen tooling. And you mentioned David Nishimura's site, which is vintage pens. I'm just gonna put those links in so that everyone's got them. That'd be, that'd be very helpful. I, I think um, sometimes as a, uh, the pennant have a list of uh, uh, available parts and things like that. Or repairs. Um, yes, they do. Here's a issue of one here, pennant, and that's part of the Pen Collectors of America. If you are a member there, you get the pennant as part of that, and they've got uh, lots of that. They've got a whole pen repair directory in the back of each issue. Yeah, we, had a, we had a question about the difference between silicone and uh, uh, and latex rubber pen sacks. Okay, so. Um, for from the beginning of time until uh, uh, really, I don't know, I can't think of how long it lasted, probably until uh, the, the Parker 51 era metrics, all, all of the sacks were made of latex rubber. And uh, it's very easy to use and it's uh, uh, very easy to get replacements. The problem has been, at least for some collectors, that the latex rubber discolors the plastic in the pens. There's sulfur in it, and the sulfur leaks out after a while and uh, will react with the plastic and discolor the pen. Some people go so far as to remove the sacks entirely out of their uh, valuable plastic pens, such as you know, dual full black and pearl or dual full green and pearl, because they don't want them to discolor. In certain circumstances, then you can use a silicone rubber sack, which does not have silicone based, uh, and which which um, some people like and some people use in their, their diaphragms in the 51s, uh, and they think they hold up better. I, I'm uh, agnostic. I like them both. Uh, it's just uh, I, I've had access to, to rubber sacks for a long time. And uh, uh, I generally prefer working with them, but silicone ones are, are pretty good. Uh, I think they can both be cemented on in the same fashion, and uh, uh, silicone is a little easier to clean. So that would be my my take on those two. Oh, thank you very much. Sure. And I can show, I'm going to remove the spotlight here quick and just kind of show what he was talking about with the discoloring. You might be able to see that's a black and pearl dual fold there. And you can see the barrel is more amber in color than the cap. So, right. So some people think it's the ink, but I think it's the sulfur in the sack, which, which causes that. And, uh, you know, it's, it's uh, a little sad. Uh, when you have such a, a gorgeous pen, you know that's a that was the the zenith of uh, of the dual film. That was the deluxe model. You can see there's an extra little uh, gold band over the clip. Did you notice that on your pen? Hold it up yeah. again. 
see if I can get that on camera. Yeah, that's an extra band on it. Yeah, right there up at the cap, yeah. right, right. Right there. Yeah. So that, that was an indication of the Lux model and some of the nibs said do hold the Lux on that, pretty nice. So yeah, great pen. And uh, uh, the thing is, if you found one that was not discolored, you would not be inclined to ever write with it or use it. Right, I'm I'm kind of one of the weird ones. I actually like that ambering color that the, the barrel get. I wish the cap did the same thing. Yeah, no, they're generally not even, right? Yeah. All right. Well, it looks like we are out of questions. So I well, guess we thank can... you everyone for your patience. And uh, again, if you have uh, questions about materials or things that we talked about, and you know, you talk to Ken or email him or me, you know, we'll be happy to provide you with any of the things that we talked about or sources or, or things like that. Or if you have a question about a repair or a manual, I can shoot you a picture. Or I'll be happy to do that. And where can people reach you? Uh, dzazoff at yahoo.com. And that in chat there, so. That's me. Everyone can grab it. Awesome. Well, Dan, thank you so much for spending time with us tonight and uh, going through that. I, I never realized how many tools there are out there that are so specialized and definitely learned of a few that I need to track down like that inner cap removal tools is kind of an amazing idea. Yeah, it's, uh, it's a neat thing. But I think I think pen tooling has still got them. So I'll just check with them, okay? Yeah, I will. Thank you very okay. much. And for everyone else, thank you so much for uh, coming to the Pen and Penmanship Expo that we ran the last three weekends. Uh, this pretty much wraps up the expo. And, you know, I see a lot of faces on here tonight that have been kind of with us along the way. And thank you so much for uh, the support and coming out and checking out all our great uh, sessions and seminars. And uh, we really appreciate uh, your support. So thanks to everybody. Thank you, Dan. Thank you, Dave. I see Dave there. Uh, if Ann is within earshot, thank you to Ann and Dave, who are the directors of the St. Louis Pen Show. And My fondest wish is that we will all be together and see each other very soon. Yeah, hopefully I'll see you in uh, Dallas. Yep, I'll be there. All right. Look all forward right. to it. Thanks. Thank you. You're welcome. Got it. Thanks a lot, everybody. Enjoy Bye -bye. the rest of your weekend.